So thank you uh, everybody for coming today. Apologies for the delay in uh, postponing this, but we're glad that everybody was still able to make it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, my name is Ryan Margolis and I am the VP for programming and events uh, for the Graduate Student Assembly here at UTD. Uh, so like I said before, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today for another amazing presentation from uh, a combination of Deloitte, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and GSA. Um, today, we're going to have the continued privilege of having Beth Gwerwe lead a powerful and interactive discussion on the traits of being involved uh, with an inclusive leader. So for those of you that don't know, Beth is the North Texas Marketplace Leader for Deloitte, which she's spent the last 25 years working for. So without further ado, uh, Beth, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ryan. It is a pleasure to be here. And just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. I have to check that in a virtual setting. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, thank you for having me. Uh, I believe this is a, a, an annual event for me at this point. I'm, I'm very lucky to be invited back each year. I want to especially thank Dr. Pearson, Rosie, Ryan, yourself, uh, Jasmine, the entire team that puts these events on. It's been quite challenging over the last couple of years with having to shift from an in-person event to a virtual event to uh, challenges as we had last, uh, last month. So thank you all uh, as participants for, for re-engaging with this topic. Um, as Ryan mentioned, my name is Beth Gerwe. I'm a managing director with Deloitte, and I get the pleasure of leading our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, efforts in this uh, marketplace, in the North Texas marketplace. Now, Deloitte, we're, we're leader-led. So my, my day job, if you will, I work in our tax organization, and I'm leading a large-scale um, digital deployment effort um, for, for that effort. So I get to do a lot of things. And as Ryan mentioned, thanks for pointing that out, Ryan, that I've been with Deloitte for nearly a quarter of a century at this point. When you put it in those terms, uh, it, it, I, you know, I feel that a little bit. But uh, every day I learn something new. I'm really excited to be back here speaking with uh, folks from UTD. Um, this is a little bit uh, like going home. I am an alum of UTD. I obtained my master's in organizational behavior there. And uh, my undergraduate is from the University of Oklahoma in industrial engineering. And so again, thrilled to be here. And when we were picking topics, we, were, we always discussed, you know, what topic would be of interest? Um, this topic of inclusive leadership came to the forefront very quickly for us. And I think you'll find that it's, a, it's an important topic. It certainly is an important piece of uh, DEI efforts. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about that. Now, knowing I'm presenting to an academic uh, setting, I wanted to start with a little bit of research. So let me, if I can, share my screen. Um, so um, as we, as I wanted to, I wanted to start with uh, a little bit of research, um, and uh, I wanted to start with some of our more recent surveys around the idea of CEO sentiment. And if you if you look at the slide, um, this slide starts with uh, going back to um, the the June 2020 survey. And we worked with Fortune on this survey. And um, you can see here that at that time, if you take yourself back two years, it was just after the pandemic started. Uh, the murder of George Floyd had occurred. There was a huge social awareness around the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion. And at that time, 62% of CEOs um, said that they, they had planned to make policy changes in their, the areas of DEI. 
Well, we wanted to repeat that. So we repeated that survey by October of that year. And what we found is that the commitments were even stronger at that point. So uh, over time, what we saw is that at that point in time, in October 2020, 96% of CEOs said that, they're, that DEI was a strategic priority or goal for them, for themselves. And that was something that was interesting because you, you began to see these CEOs taking personal uh, ownership of the DEI agenda. Now, fast forward, and I know this slide is very, very busy, but I would, and I'll let you absorb this. But what I'll, what I'll draw your attention to are the arrows in the um, bottom right corner here, where you can see the June 2020, October 2020, and now finally, when we repeated this again in June of 2021, what we showed is that there truly had been some progress. CEOs had completed building, 61% uh, of the CEOs had completed building DEI into their strategic uh, priorities or goals for themselves. 59% um, reported that they had disclosed DEI metrics to their employees, which was something that typically wasn't done in organizations previously. And then 55%, uh, which had incorporated DEI into their corporate strategy. So it became something more than just a, a talent strategy. It became part of their corporate strategy. So it did feel like a, a shift had occurred. And I think we can all agree, when you look at the demands in the marketplace, the demands in our talent market, uh, it's ever increasing that people are holding corporations and organizations accountable for making progress in this area. Let's start with a couple of definitions. So we all know diversity is focused around representation. Inclusion really is understanding how do, we, how do we leverage those unique strengths that we each bring into the organization. And what we're seeing is a lot more emphasis around this idea of equity, or what are the outcomes of, of people having that fair access, fair opportunities, and, and the power really to thrive in organizations. And what I like about this particular slide is on the, the bike example. And it really helps us understand the difference between being uh, having equality versus equity. And what we're starting to see on the corporate landscape is a lot more discussion around this concept of equity and how do you how do you begin to measure those outcomes and really show those outcomes and in the past you would hear people talking about their d and i initiatives and now you see that a lot more as their dei diversity equity and inclusion initiatives and and efforts so now how does inclusive uh, leadership begin to, to play a role in this? And I would contend that that's uh, such a, a critical part. And I hope you'll agree with me by the time we finish this session today in the sense that inclusive leaders really have an impact on your day-to-day -day and how you feel in the organization. They play such a critical role. And I would also contend that we're each leaders. So whether we're in a point where we're a named leader and recognized in that way, or whether we're an informal leader within our teams and um, you know, for students who may be on, you know, I know you're working in teams, I know you're, you're interacting quite often in groups, you have that ability to demonstrate these inclusive leadership behaviors. And this becomes even more important as our world changes. Our markets are becoming um, um, much more global. And uh, you know, we are interacting with people who come from uh, maybe a different area than where our own perspectives come from. 
um, we're if we're if we're in an organization, the consumer base that we're catering to is much more diverse, and all the research will will show us um, that our populations are becoming much more diverse. Um, innovation and in technology begins to play a cross link in this, in that, um, especially the last two years within the pandemic, organizations really had to up their game in, the, in moving along that digital continuum. And so it's causing us to be more innovative. And uh, frankly, you know, if you don't, I think it was uh, Bill Gates that said, if you don't innovate, if organizations don't innovate, they die. And I think we've seen that. You, you really have to be innovative. We've seen a lot, a, lot, a lot of innovation happen over the past couple of years in a very condensed, condensed time frame. And then finally, I would mention that the talent market, the talent market, I think, will never go back to where it was. We've all heard of the great resignations going on. People are changing seats all over the place. And uh, it's really, it's, it's an important thing when you're, you're looking at your talent market because people are searching for those organizations that are inclusive and bring that forward. So this concept of having inclusive leaders or those inclusive leadership traits are very important. And there are six of those that I'd like to cover today. Those are cognizance of bias, curiosity, cultural intelligence, collaboration, commitment, and courage. So we'll dive into each of those as we move forward. So let's start with the first, cultural intelligence. <clears throat> And a highly inclusive leaders, what we found, are very um, confident and they're very effective in dealing with cross-cultural interactions. Um, they take an active interest in learning about the cultures of others, and they're very aware of what they bring into that situation about their own culture. They're uh, highly adaptable, so they're able to work well with, with individuals in different cultural backgrounds, and they're able to drive and work across those cro cross-cultural teams, but they still remain very authentic to themselves. So uh, today, because we are virtual, I wanted to be interactive. So I'm going to ask you um, for our first interactive part is to use the annotation. So at the very top of your screen, if you're not uh, familiar with, with Zoom, there's something called annotate. If you click that, then you'll be able to click a stamp. And what I'd like you to do is to use that to put a stamp for which part of the world really influences your own culture. So I'd love to get a feel, thank you very much. Yep, I'd like to see those stars and stamps uh, applying. And, and what you'll find is, um, you know, just in this microcosm of a, a, a smaller select group of us, we're very vast in our cultural upbringings, those, those parts of the world that begin to influence us. And I'll tell you, I currently am working and leading a global team and a global deployment. And uh, I get the, the pleasure of working with people from Canada to the US to Mexico to um, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, um, Japan, uh, uh, the UK, Germany, Belgium, Sweden, I really have the pleasure of working across the team. And to be an inclusive leader, I have to bring forward that curiosity and to really understand that I bring a certain perspective into that because I would put my star in the US. And that's where my cultural upbringing has been. But I have to recognize the fact that others bring a different viewpoint of the world. So again, the first trait, and Andrea, if you could clear us out, and if I'd ask everybody to turn your annotate off. Um, so as we go forward, we will um, not, not be popping up on the, the slides. We'll do that again later. But uh, let's move forward. 
and talk about the second trait. The second trait is around curiosity. And when you think about highly inclusive leaders, highly inclusive leaders have this open mindset and they have a desire to really understand how are others viewing the world and what's their experience in it. They also have this uh, ability to cope with ambiguity. So um, they're very in engaging and they're respectful when they're asking questions and they're, they're trying to understand the viewpoints of others. They like to take perspectives and, and they, they, they really have this desire for continuous learning. So um, that's part of this curiosity as they go forward. And they have this openness that they're seeking the opportunities to connect out with a range of people so that they're getting that growth and they're getting those different perspectives pulled in. Um, Michael Dell, I think, said it, that he believes that one of the future attributes of CEOs is going to be this idea of curiosity because organizations are going to have to continue to learn. So as a highly inclusive leader, it's an excellent trait that we see in those leaders. So that's curiosity. Um, the next one is around commitment. And this is an interesting one because highly inclusive leaders are committed to the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's, they're committed because it aligns with their personal value statements. They believe deeply in the business case and they've aligned that now with their personal values. And oftentimes that's because of an experience they've had in the past, um, maybe a positive or a negative experience. It really is uh, something that they they just personally it's a heart and mind uh, head and mind uh, a heart thing. They they really take it to heart, and they believe that. So they have that personal commitment. Let's talk about the business case for a minute. If you look at um, the research, what it will show you is this concept of diverse diversity of thinking, and how high performing teams want that to be included because that brings about more creativity. And what our research shows is that it in increases innovation by about 20% when you have diverse thoughts brought into play. And we know that diversity is not enough. We know that creating this inclusive culture is uh, very important as well. And the research shows us that those organizations with inclusive cultures are two times as likely to meet or exceed their financial targets. They're three times as likely to be high performing. They're six times as likely to be innovative or agile. And how important is that? I mean, if you just look at the last two years, the organizations that were able to very quickly shift position or innovate, um, such an important aspect. And then they're eight times as likely to achieve better business outcomes overall. Now, how it relates to inclusive leaders is in, inclusive leaders are, are sort of the engine in that. And, and they really leave a, what we say is a long shadow. They cast a long shadow because it's such a difference when you have someone who exhibits those traits, the individual feeling that team members have or employees have of, of feelings of inclusiveness. And those raise about 70%. Team performance increases about 17% and almost 30% in the reported collaboration that is going on. So the business case is there and these inclusive leaders believe it deeply, they're committed to it and they believe it um, definitely at a personal level. The next one is around collaboration. And I, I mentioned collaboration 
on the, the last slide, um, highly inclusive leaders empower individuals um, to create and, and, and to be able to leverage that diverse thinking out of a group. They're able to assemble teams that are diverse and diverse in their thinking. They're, they work really hard to make sure that it's not enough to just create a diverse team, but to make sure that that team, those voices are heard. So they create an environment and they really try to, to help with this empowerment to create a safe environment where people feel comfortable um, to speak up because you want to have that diverse thinking come to the forefront. So that's around collaboration. I now have an exercise I'd like you to do. And I'd like you to think, now I'm not gonna ask you to share this with anybody, but please take out you know, something to write with and think about your inner circle. Who are those people in your network that you go to for advice? And, and write their names down individually. Who are those, say, 10, your top 10 trusted people that you go to for advice? And I'd like you to reflect on, once you have those 10 names written, how diverse is that group? Is that group really diverse in gender, in ethnicity, in race? Is it diverse in thinking? Is it diverse in styles? How much diversity do you have in your inner circle? What kind of educational backgrounds are there? What kind of um, age backgrounds are there? And do those individuals really um, speak openly with you, or do they just tell you what you want to hear? Are you really searching for that inner circle to bring um, some diverse thinking for you? So now that you've done that on an individual level, what I would like to do, and just keep that in mind, because I'd like you to think about these two questions, and we're going to go into a breakout, I'd like you to share with the group, what were your observations about your inner circle? So as you asked yourself those questions, what were your observations? And how then might you think differently as you move forward? So Andrea, I think we're gonna have you help us move into breakout groups. And then uh, while you're in your breakout group, pick somebody who could be your spokesperson and, and we'll get some um, some reflections from the breakout groups. Well, welcome back. Hopefully that was a, um, ex a good discussion that you were able to have. And what I'd like to do is to share. So I, I know we had about five breakout rooms. I'd like to take just a, a couple of minutes to hear from some of the rooms. So I'm wondering if someone in room three is there someone from room three who could share what was the discussion like in your room? I can, I can go. Hello, I'm Apurva. Uh, I was in room three and uh, we had a good discussion. A couple of people uh, talked about, most of us, I think we had, we did have diverse groups and we acknowledged how important it was to get uh, the different perspectives and learn to be mindful about um, people who are not, don't think like you or not, not like you and uh, how that can, um, we had someone, Will, who also said how it had affected, how he had seen it make a difference in even business decisions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also had someone, uh, Rosie, who shared that it was easier for her to have a diverse uh, group when she was back in Alabama, which was a smaller place compared to she is where she is here now. And because she is in a bigger place, um, and um, I think that affected um, how diverse her group was right now, and she would like to work on it. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Great observations. Of course. How about somebody in room five? 
Hey everyone, I'm Andy. I'm, I was in room five. Hi, so Andy. we kind of discussed uh, a lot of people um, from our group really chose people who were close family or friends or coworkers. And a lot of it was just kind of determined by the environment that you were in when you made mm -hmm. those bonds with those, those people. Um, and that while, you know, for me, myself, a lot of the people on my group or my list were all white people, but we can also see that we are different. There's a lot of diversity even amongst that, that different backgrounds, different um, uh, viewpoints, different ages, things like that can be influential and kind of change the, the the idea of what you get from someone when you go to them asking a question. So uh, like I said, environmental and just really people that we trusted were the people that were in that group. Yeah, uh, this uh, this concept of trust <clears throat> and uh, I know I was just writing an article last night on this concept of trust and the, the importance of trust. Those are uh, fascinating uh, observations and, and, and how important that is just in an organization, if you will, not to mention uh, the people that you're reaching out to. And I love the other thing you brought out, Andy, it was about the, um, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be racially diverse or ethnically diverse, but there's this concept of diverse thinking that I think is, is also coming to the forefront. So thank you for sharing. And let's do um, one more. Who, who's in room four? I can speak for our room. Um, so overall, it was kind of what Andy also mentioned that it is kind of a matter of your environment. And a lot of the people in room four were from UTD, which is very diverse. And so they had a lot of bonds that they made with their coworkers and family members that made had them had a very diverse group. We talked about future directions and moving forward, how to continue that. And some of the thoughts were about being very intentional with the connections mm -hmm. that you maintain and that you cultivate, as well as being intentional in uh, exposing yourself to different groups and activities so that you'd be exposed to opportunities of meeting new people. Yeah, I, I think that's that's that intentionality is exactly what I wanted to bring forward in this reflection of how can you be a little bit more intentional of, of, of getting more diverse perspectives and to pull that in, where can you do that? And I, I think it is interesting because you don't just want to go up to somebody you've never met before Although it is interesting if you ask just a random person, but if you're dealing with something that you know is 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 a of substance, you you want that trust. But where can you expand your inner circle so that you're getting that diverse thinking? You're you're reaching out. And you're being more intentional to pull in those diverse perspectives. So um, thank you all very much. I mean, it was, uh, I, I hope it was a, a, a good conversation in your rooms and that that self-reflection was helpful. We'll do another exercise in a little bit as well. Um, let's move forward and let's talk about the next trait, which is around cognizance of bias. And uh, highly inclusive leaders are very mindful of the fact that they bring a bias because we each have personal biases that we bring into play and their organization has um, biases. And, and these biases are really unconscious. Um, and so what highly inclusive leaders do is they begin to look at, um, you know, how do they self-regulate that? How can they put processes in place that ensure that their personal bias isn't influencing the decisions of the overall group? Um, and how are they putting processes in place and they're continually looking for this idea of fair play? So how um, can they make informed decisions as they move forward, and they're but they're constantly listening for where biases, either from themselves or from an individual or from the organization, may be playing a role. Now, what I'm going to do, and and I, I'd ask you to get ready to type in the chat uh, what you see. I'm going to flash a couple of of images up. And I'd like, like you to just tell me what your first instinct is of what that image is. So the first one that we have, what do you see here? See a rabbit? 
You see a duck? Do you see something else? I'm gonna look in the chat box. Okay. Some people seeing both. Um, lots of lots of ducks. Lots of ducks, few rabbits. So the point is that um, and yes, but what was you, you know, what is that first instinct that you saw um, as you go through? So the next one I'm going to flash up, the very first thing you see, that's what I'd like you to record. Here you go, what do you see there? You see a word, do you see a face? That's the very first thing you see. Lots of faces. Can you see the word in here? It starts with an L I A R in script. And so, um, what we we'll, what we get is people's first instinct is just your view of the world and how you see that. So this idea of unconscious bias, it's that automatic or that unintentional judgment or assessment that is influenced by our backgrounds, how we've been brought up, what our parents have told us, um, our cultural environments that we've grown up in. So someone who grew up in um, India may have a different immediate reaction than someone who grew up in Australia. Those may be very different because of the environments they grew up in or our personal experiences. So uh, it may be that, wow, you know, someone walks in with a red coat on and I've had bad experiences with people with red codes. I can tell you that my son, if I take him to a medical setting and someone with a white coat walks in, his blood pressure goes up. It's called white coat syndrome. And that's just the automatic response bit based on experiences he's had in the past. And this operates with beyond our control. And, and we could go into the neuroscience of this, but our brains are wired to make those shortcuts. And that's how we as humans have survived all this time. It, it helps us to make those shortcuts. Unfortunately, sometimes that begins to, well, it, it often informs our perception of a person or a group of people or a situation. And that then can influence our decision-making because we're starting with that assumption that our brains make in that, in that judgment that our brains jump to. So what do we do about that? So if you ask me, well, Beth, if it's unconscious, I mean, gosh, what can I do about it? You can do something. So you can slow down and pause and really think about, um, am I making uh, certain assumptions here that maybe I shouldn't make? You can ask yourself, questions, you know, how do I know this? Or is this an assumption I'm making? Did I jump to a conclusion here? Um, you can try to minimize those assumptions or assertions. You can seek out other perspectives, right back to our inner circle exercise. How do I get different perspectives from different people? I often find when I do that, that I, I learn something in that process. I get a perspective. Um, or you can look for alternative data kind of prove yourself wrong. Some people call this being the devil's advocate. You just try to prove yourself wrong and certainly be curious about others. Tell me about your ideas. How do you see this situation? So those are just some of the things we can do to overcome unconscious biases that we might be having. But uh, leaders for sure, inclusive leaders are aware of the fact that they bring these forward. So I wanna do another annotate exercise. So again, go up and press your annotate button, use the stamp, and I'm curious, we're gonna talk about this last uh, concept or last trait around courage. And I'd like, to, I'd like you to be honest, nobody's gonna judge here. How courageous have you been over say the last year as it relates to DEI? Uh, you know, are you someone who speaks out when you see something? Um, 
where where do you fall on this continuum? So if you could just put your stamp on somewhere on the continuum of where you think you are. If I were probably placing my stamp here, I would probably place it somewhere towards the middle. I would grade myself as someone who certainly I see myself as a, a, an ally, an advocate, but have I really been as courageous as I potentially could be in all situations? So if I'm truly honest with myself, I think I have a lot more growth in this particular area. And you can see that just within our group here, um, we've got people who have placed themselves across the continuum. So we have a continuum of, of courageousness within, um, within the group here. So Andrea, if you could clear the stamps and if I could ask everybody to turn their annotate off, then um, go forward and let's talk about courage. So highly, this is our sixth trait. Highly inclusive leaders um, speak up and they challenge the status quo. And they're, they're really humble about their own personal limitations, their own strengths, their own weaknesses that they bring to the, the table. They, again, you'll, you'll hear this common theme. They continue to seek the contributions of others. They don't have to be the leader that has all the answers. They seek out that and they're brave because sometimes it takes that bravery to speak up and challenge the status quo and to say, hey, that really isn't right. Um, so courage is our last trait. And I have one more exercise for you. And again, this is a personal exercise. Make a note of it. Where would you rate yourself on the scale of never being a one, to always being at the, the uh, top end for these questions around courage. So how often would uh, the people you work with or interact with describe you as someone that says what needs to be said in the moment? From your perspective, does the team you uh, work with, the people you most interact with, do they feel comfortable being open and honest with you? How, how often do you openly acknowledge your own personal limitations? Um, I'll give you, I, I did this this morning. I, somebody was talking about um, security protocols on a software platform and I am certainly not the expert in that. So I'm seeking others' opinions as I pull that in. Um, how often do you compliment in, in the courage that others have spoken up and, and encourage them to do that and make them feel comfortable about that? And have you thought about putting courage in your professional development and, and making that um, an arrow, so to speak, in the quiver of your professional skills. So now that you've kind of taken that quiz on your own, we are going to go back into uh, breakout groups. You guys did a great job before. Pick, pick a spokesperson. We'll do the same thing. And what I want to know is around this area of courage. You know, what are your observations? And then how will you exhibit more courage moving forward? So once again, if we could break out, I would appreciate that. Thank you. I'm very excited to see how your conversations went. Let's start with room one this time. Is there someone who can speak for room one? Don't make us call names. I have the list. Sorry, I lost track of which room we were in. Was that my room? Who's speaking? Emma. Emma. Emma that's us. Yes. All right, Emma. Are you volunteering? Thank you. <laughs> so we had a really interesting discussion, and two of the kind of main observations that we had was talking about um kind of our personal versus professional experience. And some of us were more likely to speak out in our personal lives or in our professional lives. And also talking about 
how um, stepping into different roles or being in different situations uh, make it where you have to sort of work on some of those questions that you scored lower on. Um, so for example, uh, Andy and myself both talked about how when we stepped into different staff roles, it kind of uh, makes you uh, work more on speaking and being that person who uh, is uh, commenting on things as compared to doing the more like personal work questions like acknowledging your own limits and how um, a lot of us shared the kind of um, answer that we were going to be exhibiting courage moving forward by kind of working on those um, things that we scored ourselves lower on. Excellent. And so Emma, when you talked about that, it sounds like it depended on the role, it depended on the newness of yourself to that role, right? And your comfort level, I guess, within that role. And it sounds like the expectations of that role may have played a part on the professional side. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, definitely. And then on the personal side, people may feel more passionate about different topics and have different levels of courage. Interesting, interesting. Thank you. How about room two? Let's just go down the list here. Okay, room two, uh, Prakash Malik is my name. Hi, I think our conclusion was you must express your viewpoint because different viewpoints lead to better decisions. We must be, uh, what they say, disagree, but not being disagreeable. So rather mm. than condemning and criticizing, and in this climate of political correctness, sometimes we feel, or if I say, like if I say, will it hurt birth, Beth's feelings? That should not be the deciding factor. You must present the facts without being judgmental of others' point of view. And unless we get different points of view, then only you get better decisions. And if you keep quiet, maybe if you had something to say that nobody else had thought of, and that would help bring up a better decision. So be, be polite and courteous, but must express what you have. That's only, that's your contribution to the group. Thank I, you I, I love that. And, and, and I think that what you're demonstrating is the importance of each of us exhibiting these inclusive leadership behaviors. And, and being able to do that, whether you're the stated leader of a group or not. I also love the fact that you said, wouldn't it be a shame if there was the idea that would change everything and that individual just was afraid to speak up and share their idea. So it really is incumbent upon each of us to pull others in. So I like that a lot. Thank you so much for sharing that. Good discussion. How about room three? <clears throat> I think that was us. Uh, <laughs> we, we had, so this is so nice. I have such great coworkers and students and everybody here. Um, that was a good discussion. So a uh, lot of different things. One was that age helps. As you get older, you just don't <clears throat> give a rat's behind uh, as often. Uh, one discussion thread was about the difference between being strong and being courageous, that it, it, you, can, mm. you can be strong, but you, but you have to practice being courageous and figuring out when and where. Um, somebody pointed out that they felt comfortable saying things, but not always being as diplomatic as might be most um, mm. helpful, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. one thing to say, this is wrong. And if you're really emotional about it, it's good that you're speaking out, but you may not get the desired results. Um, and a comment from Shanika, I'm calling you out by name because I thought it was really, really good who said that it has helped her to think of those who came before her. 
that you are not just, it's not just about you, but it's a part of you, you being a part of a greater, um, interesting, something greater, and that you have a role to play, you have a responsibility. Um, and, and, and I think several of us nodded at that and, and be not, it be not it not being about you, but about something much bigger. Right. And, and you are part of the evolution in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion. I think that's a, the, the, all great points. I really like that point of I'm, I'm part of this evolution. I'm part of this journey and moving us forward and having the courage to do so. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, th I think we're doing okay on time. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask for group four. See if we can get to all the rooms. I wasn't sure we'd be able to do this, but I think we've managed our time appropriately. Group four? I think Andre, I'll go. Yeah, go ahead. Andre is wrong. <laughs> uh, so basically in our um, group, we had a very wide range of uh, one individual said she felt very courageous about taking on all of these questions and because she viewed the world in a beautiful way and she felt like she had to stand up for it. Um, on the other end, we had someone who was a little bit more shy about it. And she said that even though she's had a lot of mentors that were very diverse, that didn't always empower her to get there until she came in a role that that was her job, like protecting the students. And so once, you know, that she got into this role, it was, she felt like she had more room to be courageous. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that was noted was that sometimes how courageous you are, it's dependent also in the culture you come from. Like mm -hmm. it's possible that you came from a culture that didn't always encourage opinions like this and so you now have to overcome your own cultural um you know training from many years in order to be courageous so those were the general thoughts um in our group yeah uh fascinating way and that's why i wanted to end on this this topic of courage because i do think that all of those things come into play of the the fact that you know your your personal comfort level with that um, it comes into play, just like your personal biases come into play, uh, and I think that's an interesting point to bring up. I also uh, you know I like that the, you know the world's a beautiful place, and uh, it's part of my my role to continue that that beauty. And and I think you're underscoring what was brought up in a previous group about sometimes your role gives you courage. Sometimes another person just encouraging you will give you courage as well. So you begin to see why these traits of being an inclusive leader is not just limited to the person who's named at the, the top of the box. Thank you. So let's go to group five. We're gonna do it. We're gonna get all five in. Group five, what was your discussion? I think that was my group. Uh, like uh, Andrea, we had a very, very wide range of uh, opinions. We had uh, uh, some a uh, couple of uh, folks who were very courageous. They ranked themselves high and feel free to to speak and you know and and uh, 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 found a good value to to speaking and and. Uh, uh, being open and and um, and such, but we also had the other extreme of. But uh, sometimes I don't open, I don't tell my opinions because it won't matter. Uh, mm. So that concern that well, you may hurt somebody's feelings, you may cause a a disrupt environment, and then it just in the end it doesn't matter anyways. Um, and then we came mm. up kind of to a, 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 a thinking that maybe. One good thing is to work on our communication skills because sometimes you don't have other choice other than actually you have to step up. And at that point, in you struggle how you uh, you you speak up or you're courageous, you defend who needs to be defended in a way that your message is is um, well received. So you are not really. Uh, being aggressive, you don't need to be aggressive to be courageous, right? So in a, right. in a sense that we need, to, that's a struggle, how to find the words, how to find the means to 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 actually be courageous without uh, 
uh, and in a, uh, I would say in a harmony, in that environment, like in a harmony, if we can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you're pointing to is this last bullet, uh, you know, this last question, have you embedded that in your own professional development? And you bring forward the idea of how do I present my ideas? How do I raise those concerns in a way where I, I gain more comfort because I have more confidence in how I'm raising those, but also they're heard. And they're heard not as complaints, but they're heard as respectful challenges. Um, excellent. Excellent. As, as always, UTD <laughs> always impresses me with the thoughts. It furthers my thinking. Um, and I look forward to continuing conversations. So what's next? I mean, what? so we talked about inclusive leadership, but what comes next? Um, just to give you a glimpse into some of the things that I think are on the horizon, one is around this idea of data and transparency. We're seeing that a lot more with organizations. I think as technology begins to rise, we're going to start seeing data being used in different ways. And it will be important of how are we truly measuring that equity? How are we truly getting those measured outcomes? The idea of allyship, I think, has been highlighted for the last couple of years, certainly came into the, the forefront. Um, there were certainly a lot of allies that came forward, and I think that will, will continue, continue on. Um, this idea of the evolving role of boards around advancing DEI, as I mentioned at the very top, we're seeing in our surveys that this is becoming not only a talent strategy issue, but a corporate strategy issue. And that will um, continue to move forward. The idea of moving forward with equity and, and how does that begin to look? And, and you're, I'm seeing it, everybody I talk to, I see DEI starting to pop out. And, and I hadn't seen that two or three years ago. Um, this renewed or expanded focus around representation, I think organizations are challenging themselves in that way. Do we have the right representation at all levels within our organization, not only our entry level? So there's going well beyond only campus recruiting, but do we have those representations on our boards at our executive level? Um, another one is around the intersection of DEI with uh, well-being. And I think if, again, this last two years have taught us nothing else, is this concept of taking care of our employees and really paying attention to the physical and um, mental uh, health and the well-being of individuals is going to intersect DEI. Not everybody has those same needs. Um, and so you can't have a one size fits all. Somebody who's uh, further along in their career is going to have different needs than, than somebody, um, somebody else. And then finally, the idea of accountability absolutely uh, is coming to the forefront um, and, and making sure that our, these corporations and ourselves, frankly, are held accountable for all the things that we know is the right direction moving forward. So there's a lot more, I think, that are on the horizon as we move forward. So if Rosie's listening, which I hope she, she still is listening, there's probably some topics for further discussion as we move forward. Um, so I'm gonna ask you this, just what one thing are you going to do based on our conversation today? If you're, if you feel free to put it in the chat, if you're open or just write it down on a piece of paper, take it away with you, put it in your head. What is that one thing that you think you'll do different based on our conversation today? And if you'd like to do more research, there's a ton of research out on Deloitte.com. You can look up uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can look in our human capital area. There's a lot of research we have out there. I mentioned one that just came out around uh, trust in this area as it relates to DEI. And I think you'll find a lot of additional information that's going to be useful for you. With that, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you so much for 
sharing your, your part of your day with me. Thank you for inviting me back um, to be part of the UTD community. Uh, it's always wonderful to be here. And with that, Siri, I think I'm going to hand it to you. And you have some actual uh, things that can happen to express inclusive leadership on campus. Yes, thank you, Beth. Um, so I think my, my slides are about to be put up. Uh, but my name is Siri Wilder, and I'm with the Graduate Student Assembly at University of Texas at Dallas. Um, so I work on the programming committee, and I specifically uh, focus on diversity initiatives with the school. Um, so we can advance to the next slide, uh, because I'm going to talk about opportunities for students to fulfill leadership roles and pursue leadership at the university. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So the first uh, opportunity is this amazing student leadership program that UTD has. Um, it's open to students of all levels and, and all of these programs I'm gonna be talking about are available for undergraduate students and graduate students. The student leadership program in particular offers a certification program that can help students um, to, to become stronger leaders um, and to have these leadership opportunities. There are also special events throughout the year, so uh, networking events and retreats. Um, and there's also this opportunity to be on the student leadership advisory board. So this is just a committee of students who help kind of determine leadership activities within the student leadership program um, and to plan and conduct these activities. And then finally, they offer this strengths quest, which is kind of this recognition of your strengths um, and talents and how to, how to build on them, how to work on those. Uh, so we can advance to the next slide. We also have the Student Organization Center at UTD, and we have a huge amount of registered student organizations. The benefit of having a registered student organization is that you have the opportunity for funding, um, to advertise, and to find you know, your community of students. So if you don't see an organization that you're interested in participating in and maybe finding a leadership role and becoming an active participant of an already existing student organization, you also have the opportunity to apply and create your own student organization. And that involves, you know, going through and coming up with a constitution um, and kind of determining exactly what your organization um, is going to be. So there's also um, student uh, coordinators. Um, and this is an opportunity to kind of guide new student organizations uh, to plan kind of workshops and leadership opportunities um, and to basically go through, uh, you know, all the student funding requests that are coming in. So this is an excellent opportunity to be involved with student organizations on campus. So we can go to the next slide. So um, we also have the student government. And this is, you know, just an amazing opportunity for students to be involved um, on the Senate and different university committees across the entire campus. Um, so you'd be, you know, working with faculty, you'd be working with staff and fellow students um, to kind of, you know, work on issues on campus um, to, you know, address student concerns. Uh, so this is a wonderful opportunity. You can also become a senator, so you can, you know, if you want to be a part of the Student Senate, you can campaign for that, um, and that would kind of allow you that opportunity um, according to what school you're in, and then also what year you're in in the program. And then finally, we have this new opportunity, this Make UTD Green Project, and this is an amazing opportunity. This is kind of your chance to come in and say, you know, I think we should do this. I think this would help UTD to become more sustainable, more green, and I would like to do it this way. So again, a really great leadership opportunity there. And then we have our last slide. So we also have a graduate student assembly on campus. This is specifically for graduate students. The graduate student assembly basically is just like it says, the voice for graduate students on campus. It gives you a chance to, um, you know, tell the school what you need to advocate for other graduate students and yourself. 
There are many, many opportunities for leadership with the GSA. So I'm part of the GSA on the programming committee, like I mentioned, so that we have a bunch of different committees. Uh, and based on what you're interested in, uh, you really can just look through and say, you know, do I want to be on the program committee? Maybe I want to be on the public relations committee, um, whatever speaks to your strengths. We also have the executive board. Um, so, you know, president, vice president um, for all of these different um, opportunities, administration, programming, like Ryan is the VP programming who you saw at the beginning of this presentation. And then we have school reps for every single school at UTD. Um, and that would just allow you to kind of um, be the leader for your school and speak for your school. And then finally, we have the GSA reps. That's representing GSA in all of the university committees. So I mentioned before with the, um, uh, with the student government that you know, there's all these uh, school committees. And so this would allow you to kind of participate as a graduate student speaking up for other graduate students. Uh, so again, huge amount of opportunities. Um, you know, I've included the links at the bottom and you should get the links afterwards uh, if you are interested in pursuing any of these. So with that, I'm going to hand the speaker over to Dr. Yvette Pearson, who is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion here at UTD. Thanks so much, Siri. And thank you everyone for attending. I think. Jasmine said that at the peak, there were maybe close to 90 or 100 folks here. And I think that's tremendous, especially for an online event that had to be rescheduled. So thank you all for your time today. And thank you, Beth, for joining us and for your flexibility and for the tremendous amount of wisdom and insight and expertise you were able to share with everyone today. Um, it, it's really good to have times for self-reflection and to be able to take that look in the mirror is so important to our journey toward becoming a more equitable and inclusive campus. And one thing I like about the way the exercises were structured is that it points out that it starts with us. And so just coming in, hearing the discussions from the breakout groups, it was great to see how folks were hearing and learning from each other's perspectives. It's such a critical part of what we do. So I just wanna charge us and challenge us to take what we've learned here and apply it within our individual spheres of influence. If we can all do that, we'll move a lot farther and we'll be a lot stronger as an institution. And I saw someone in the chat uh, put a message, lead from where you are. And I think that is very important because it's not about the role or the title or position you hold. Each and every one of us is a leader. So with that, I wanna also say thank you to our institutional diversity initiatives team, Ms. Rosie and Jasmine and Xavier. I continue to be amazed with how much you all do with such a small core. Uh, Ryan and Siri and the GSA, it was really exciting when I joined last fall to get an email from graduate students saying, hey, we, we have this initiative that's a part of our regular programming. And just to be able to learn and, and watch your leadership grow and develop. So thank you. And as always, there are folks behind the scenes who don't say a whole lot, but without them, none of this would come together. So I wanna thank Bruce and Sean and Helen for always being willing to be those hands on deck to make sure everything happens. With that, I will say have a great day, a great rest of the semester and have a happy and impactful rest of uh, this Black History Month. And I'll toss it back to Siri for door prizes. We have so many people too. While we're waiting, I forgot to point out, Sean did drop a link to the post workshop survey in the chat. We always wanna know how well we did and what we could do better. So please take a few minutes to complete it, if you will. And we have our winner now, Ben Porter.
And our second, Rhea Gupta. And our third, you know, Lee. So those were our three prize winners for today. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.